So welcome, welcome. Uh, for those of you who've been here before, welcome back. But for those new names I see, welcome to our Meek webinar series. Um, so we are the Marine Environmental Education Center. We are located on Hollywood Beach, Florida, and we're a pretty small facility. So right now we are unfortunately closed. It's really hard to social distance where we are, um, but our goal is to educate the public, schools, anyone we can get our hands on to uh, learn a little bit about uh, conservation issues, environmental issues, marine science issues. Uh, so we have started this really cool webinar series to provide a free resource to anyone who's willing to learn um, so we could continue with that mission. Uh, so we are lucky enough to reach out to our awesome sciencey friends right now. Um, so I am very thankful for uh, Benjamin Kramer to be coming on today and teaching us a little bit about what he does. Uh, ben is an algae biologist uh, studying the effects of climate change on harmful toxic producing cyanobacteria in freshwater ecosystems. Um, he works with the uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, so he will be giving us a little bit of a really cool uh, divergent from our usual path. We do have, I don't know if Ben knows this, we have a green sea turtle on site. Her name is Captain. So we are very turtly focused a lot of the time, um, but it is very cool when we get to sort of expand and talk about all the different things that are affecting our environment, all the different important aspects that we really wanna know about. Um, so right now everyone is muted and everyone's videos are off. It's gonna be like that for the whole webinar just so you can most clearly hear Ben as he's presenting. But if you have any questions, comments, concerns, any sort of technical issues, I'll be here monitoring the chat the whole time. Otherwise Ben will get to all the questions at the end, okay? Um, I think that is about it for my spiel. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Ben, feel free to take it away. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Taylor. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for um, you know signing in and listening to me talk. Um, as Taylor said, my name is uh, Benjamin Kramer. I'm a PhD student at Stony Brook University, which is out in uh, Long Island in New York. Um, and as Taylor said, I am studying the effects of um, nitrogen as well as climate change on cyanobacteria or freshwater cyanobacteria specifically the ones that cause harmful algal blooms. And I'm sure you've, um, as you know, Florida citizens, I'm sure you've heard that term before, or it's acronym HAB, or harmful algal bloom. And when we're referring to um, cyanobacteria that cause these harmful algal blooms, we generally tend to refer to them as cyanohabs. Um, and I did want to spend a little bit of time going over, you know, some background information about harmful algal blooms, particularly with respect to cyanobacteria, um, before I really get into, you know, the stuff that I do, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, but the one thing that I really wanted to emphasize uh, is that um, we say that these are algal blooms, but cyanobacteria are actually not algae. Um, they are cyanobacteria, or they are cyanobacteria, meaning that they belong to the taxonomic domain prokarya, or they are prokaryotes. So on the left-hand diagram, you see a basic um, design of a cell, um, specifically the, specifically um, photosynthetic um, prokaryotes or cyanobacteria. Um, and on the right-hand side, you, see an ex you can see an example of a eukaryotic uh, photosynthetic algae. So, um, algae actually belong to the taxonomic kingdom Protista. They're sort of grouped in there with dinoflagellates like Karenia brevis, which causes red tide. They're grouped in there with kelp. Um, they're grouped in there with sea lettuce. Um, and they're all, it's just a whole, it's just a giant hodgepodge of a kingdom of a bunch of different types of organisms that um, can photosynthesize. Uh, some that have to eat other organisms in order to get their, in order to get their, you know, their energy. Um, but it's, it's kind of a mess. Um, and on the left-hand side, we have our cyanobacteria. So the main difference between these two different types of organisms, because both of them can photosynthesize, is that on the left-hand side with cyanobacteria, you can see that basically all of that DNA, um, uh, which is highlighted with the, uh, which is grouped uh, known as the nucleoid. It's not actually inside of a nucleus. And that's a common feature of all types of bacteria, not just cyanobacteria, where um, there are no organelles. Hopefully uh, you know, some of you are familiar with the 
term, but those of you who aren't, organelles are basically like the cell organs. So things like the nucleus, the mitochondria, the chloroplasts, um, those, those uh, examples and more are indicated um, in the diagram for photosynthetic eukaryotes. So cyanobacteria are structurally less complex. Um, despite that though, uh, the sheer number of cyanobacteria that are found on the planet can easily match the amount of oxygen that is produced by bigger photosynthetic organisms like plants, um, grass, trees, and other types of photosynthetic eukaryotes. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page uh, in terms of what I meant by a cyanohab. Um, it's sort of a term that's a little not technically correct because again, cyanobacteria are not actually algae, but they still form very harmful blooms in terms of the sheer amount of them that can arise during a bloom event. And also of course, based on the types of toxins that they produce. Um, but in order to kind of, again, continue with this trend of putting things into context, um, I did um, want to briefly discuss uh, about the red tide. Again, I'm sure as for the citizens, you are very familiar with the term red tide. Um, for many people that study harmful algae, Florida is sort of like the ideal uh, uh, place to about all the types of different harmful algal bloom species that can form. And of course, the, these giant swaths of red that you see along, our co along the coastline, particularly on the West Florida shelf, are just so iconic in terms of really emphasizing the severity of these blooms. Not only in terms of how they discolor the water, obviously, but in terms of the impact that they can have on wildlife. I decided to avoid showing particularly explicit photos of dead dolphins and manatees um, so I decided to just focus on, not that it's, it's still sad, but these, these massive clusters of fish that have all um, died as a result of these blooms, presumably. And these red tides are caused by these little critters that are photosynthetic eukaryotes known as Karenia brevis. And they specifically produce the toxin brevitoxin, which is a neurotoxic shellfish poison. And that's not just harmful to um, wildlife, particularly marine life, wildlife, but it can also be very harmful to us as well if we were to eat contaminated food, um, particularly shellfish. So that's the classic uh, iconic version of what we think of when we think of a harmful algal bloom. Um, but when it comes to a cyanohab, the water obviously turns green. And these are not just isolated to specific parts of the world. So even though the red tide is kind of like the idealized version of a harmful algal bloom, you generally tend to see them right along the coastline. But when it comes to a freshwater ecosystem, like a lake or a pond, all of them have the potential to experience these really intense blooms of cyanobacteria. So the first picture on the left, um, is, is uh, Lake Tahu. So that is a very large lake in China that receives a lot of input from rivers that carry a lot of nutrients, a lot of fertilizer that really boosts the numbers of um, cyanobacteria that can form these blooms. And of course, perhaps uh, um, the lake uh, in the United States that is the most significantly affected by uh, cyanohabs is Lake Erie. So you can see in the upper central uh, picture in the Western basin of Lake Erie going towards Detroit, those giant green swaths that you can see from space are basically examples of cyanohabs that go for miles and miles and miles. Now, obviously this can be a problem, not just for the wildlife, but also for humans as well. So obviously you do not want to be dipping your hands like, you know, for that dramatic effect that in that picture there, you don't want to be dipping your bare hands in that. Um, but even being in a highly, uh, a heavily urbanized area like New York City, it also has the potential to be very problematic. Um, so one thing in particular that people are starting to be concerned about is the potential for the toxins that these cyanobacteria produce to aerosolize or get into tiny little water particles that can, you know, travel a fair distance, um, you know, maybe get into the respiratory tract of people that are, you know, walking around that lake, 
or just living within a few miles of that lake. And obviously, as we know, in New York City, millions and millions of people live on top of each other. But what is actually making that water green? Well, turns out it's a whole hodgepodge of a bunch of different types of species. Um, so within a single patch of heavily green water that has effectively turned the texture of paint, um, you can have a bunch of different species. Uh, the upper left hand uh, picture is a representative of a group of species known as microcystis. Uh, that's a, a, a genus term that's used to describe a bunch of different species. Um, and microcystis in particular is perhaps kind of the equivalent of uh, Karenia brevis in the cyanobacterial world in terms of its um, how nefarious it is. And uh, it's also very abundant in all of the world's freshwater ecosystems. Uh, but there are many others that can also form blooms, particularly uh, uh, members of the genus Planktothrix, as well as members of genus Anabena, and also genus Aphanazomenon. And also, uh, one thing to really point out, it's kind of hard to see uh, in these pictures, but on the right hand side, um, organisms that belong to genus Anabena and Aphanazomenon have these really interesting looking cells. They're, they're a little bit bigger than the other ones around them. Um, remember these, they're known as heterocysts. And that's actually one of the main focuses of my, um, of my PhD. Um, so it's not, just, um, it's not just the cyanobacteria themselves uh, that are causing uh, their blooms to be harmful just by being there. But as I've said before, it's also the types of toxins that they produce. And it turns out that cyanobacteria can effectively produce a Swiss army knife of a bunch of different types of toxins. Um, the most uh, nefarious and the, again, the most kind of, the most well known of these toxins because it's so abundant in the world is known as microcystin. And it's uh, specifically known as a liver toxin. And another type of toxin that sort of performs the same sort of damaging function to people that have ingested it is known as cylindrospermopsin, which can uh, damage the liver and the kidney if you ingest uh, a sufficient amount of the toxin. And there are also other types of toxins that uh, cyanobacteria can produce, um, two of which are known to have a neurotoxic effect. One is known as saxitoxin, which is a paralytic toxin that was actually um, manufactured and developed in World War I, fun fact, uh, was uh, deployed uh, in the trenches uh, to, you know, during the time when biochemical weapons were okay to use in wartime. And then in, there's also anatoxin. Even though it l is a lot less uh, complex than any of these other toxins, it's actually incredibly um, potent and was originally characterized as very fast death factor uh, back in the 70s before they were able to figure out what it looked like. Um, so because there are so many different species of cyanobacteria that form blooms, because they produce so many different types of toxins, because they are in our drinking water supply, it's obviously a huge environmental concern. Um, and again, I'm not going to you know, blast you with a bunch of pictures that are you know, gratuitously showing you a bunch of dead animals and a bunch of dead dogs because dogs don't know any better, which is one of the main reasons why warning signs are generally put up around lakes in heavily developed areas, particularly in the United States. So that way, you know, dog owners, when they're walking their dogs along a lake, they know to make sure that their dog obviously, you know, doesn't drink the water. Although I would, as a dog owner, I would probably not want the dog to drink green water anyway, but whatever. Um, and then the United States in general has very good regulations for, um, you know, making sure that people know, hey, the toxin levels in the water are at this degree. It's no longer recreationally safe or no longer drinkable. We need to avoid it and wait for the algae to eventually die off. So the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency, the uh, recreational uh, limits, so, you know, swimming or being in proximity of that lake for microcystin, that's the liver toxin, is four micrograms per liter. So it's kind of hard to, I mean, I'm sure you probably haven't heard the term microgram before, or maybe you have, um, but microgram is a very, very small amount in a liter of, in a liter of volume. 
So it's, that is sufficient enough to make you very, very sick, if not potentially be very fatal. And for cylindrus ramopsin, the toxin is a little less potent than microcystin. So the, um, the recreational limit for that would be eight micrograms per liter. However, even though most of the developed world has good restrictions for making sure that people stay safe, um, a lot of other countries are not so fortunate. So for instance, uh, actually it was this year in Botswana, which is in Africa, um, there were about three, there were about several hundred elephants that actually drank water from a lake that was believed to have been experiencing a cyanobacterial bloom. And over the course of several weeks, 330 of them died. Um, so that was obviously a huge uh, impact on conservation efforts that are really focused on making sure that the, three, the 300,000 elephants um, in Botswana are able to you know, stay healthy and you know, not potentially become any more endangered than they already are. So it's, it's a, still a major concern, um, not, just in the, not just in the developing world, but also in the developed world. Um, but kind of going back a little bit more to, you know, the situation in America and how we stand on making sure that, you know, we're safe from cyanohabs and the toxins that they produce. Uh, the best thing about monitoring these guys is that obviously when the water is green, don't do anything with it. Don't touch it. Don't drink it. Don't swim in it. Don't let your dog drink it. Um, and then also a really another um, advancement technologically that has benefited from us being able to monitor these cyanobacteria is the um, development of tools that can measure toxins. Uh, the best one is, or arguably one of the best one, at least from in terms of keeping people safe, is known as an ELISA. So this is an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So basically, you can get a water sample, and in the course of you know anywhere between four to five hours, you can figure out the toxin concentrations in that lake. And then, you know, over the course of a day, you can let the state know, hey, this lake has a lot of toxins in it. It's not safe uh, to do anything recreationally within it. And then they will let the general public know. Um, however, there are still many shortcomings. Um, so for instance, uh, as I'm sure most people know, you know, when you eat um, the top, when you eat uh, shellfish that's contaminated with toxins um, produced by red tide, that obviously is um, not, that's obviously going to make you very, very sick. Um, but in terms of how uh, cyanotoxins can affect uh, people or other wildlife when they consume contaminated food, it's a lot less clear. So that's a huge um, gap in our knowledge in terms of understanding how, how toxins can travel through different organisms to affect other organisms that eat those organisms. Also, a lot of the toxins that cyanobacteria produce can also degrade uh, very rapidly. Um, microcystin is relatively stable, but um, anatoxin is not. So even though it's really potent, it's really hard to detect uh, in the lakes uh, or in lakes and ponds. And of course, as I mentioned before, um, there is also a lot of concern about whether uh, these toxins can aerosolize. And compared to brevitoxins, which are produced by the red tide, very little is known in terms of how these toxins can get into water droplets that can travel, you know, anywhere between a few hundred feet to maybe even a few miles and how they might be able to affect the surrounding populations. And then, of course, um, one thing that I wanted to emphasize is that even though America as a whole is doing a good job at monitoring these cyanobacteria, um, the monitoring and alerting efficiency is actually pretty state dependent. And I'll get into what that means before I uh, do some more kind of general background on what I meant by the consequences of wildlife, uh, consequences on wild, wildlife being relatively unclear. Um, so in terms of, say for instance, you see a lake that has, that's very, very green, and you also see a bunch of dead fish that are popping up on the water. So is that due to the toxins that they've come into contact with? Or is it because the, the water is very oxygen deplete as a result of this max, as a result of this massive bloom. So when oxygen levels get very, very low, we define that water system as hypoxic. So the oxygen levels are so low that animals that get their oxygen from the water no longer can breathe. So 
this kind of uh, all sort of ties into each other where, so on the left-hand side of this diagram, you see a lot of development, a lot of urbanization, but also a lot of waste in the form of urban waste or agriculture is being dumped into either a, a lake or a river or the coastline. And as a result, it's dumping a lot of nutrients into that waterway, which subsequently causes a very large bloom of algae, which can be great in the, in the short term because algae photosynthesize, they're eating up all the carbon, the problem is, is that algae, especially cyanobacteria, they don't have the lifespan of a tree. So they're not gonna be constantly photosynthesizing and sucking up all that CO2 and producing oxygen for years and years and years. When those cells die because they run out of nutrients, all of that oxygen that they, that they produce and all of that CO2 that they consumed, it all gets, it all, all the oxygen gets consumed and all that CO2 gets released. And as a result, you might have a region where, you know, especially if it's an in an enclosed body of water, like a pond, where the oxygen is just completely gone and fish will go belly up. So that's one way, especially when it comes to cyanohabs, it's still very difficult to determine whether it's the toxins that they produce that can potentially kill this wildlife or it's the lack of oxygen that's killing them. And also going back to the efficiency, of monitoring being very state uh, specific. Uh, this diagram here is essentially representing uh, those states, uh, a kind of a, a spectrum in terms of the ability of states to report on harmful cyanobacteria. So the ones that are bolded green uh, are, one, are states that do anecdotal reports of cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. And the ones that have those crossed lines in them are states that have you know, the most efficient monitoring system. So if you have a green state with those lines over them, they are, you know, the state is very involved in making sure that you know, beach closers are reported and they're also you know, emphasizing health advisories. And then finally, you have the tan ones, which are having no anecdotal reports of cyanohab poisonings. So not surprisingly, Florida and New York are, you know, part of the group that have our green states with those cross lines in them. Uh, and then, of course, you might have a few other states that aren't really on top of their game. Uh, I'm not particularly surprised that Tennessee is part of that cluster of states that is not really, you know, on the state level, it's not very good at monitoring cyanobacteria. I was actually at a conference um, last year I met someone from the Department of Health uh, in the state of Tennessee, and they said that the only time that they report a cyanobacterial bloom is when somebody uh, calls and says that their cow dropped dead from drinking the water. So it's still a pretty, it's still a big concern uh, for, you know, even, even in the United States. And obviously, of course, you know, Alaska and Hawaii, they don't have anything. Um, so it's still something that definitely needs to be worked on. But focusing on uh, New York specifically, um, it's actually a really, it has a really great monitoring system because just like Florida, it's basically a harmful algal bloom cesspit. So we only really need to look at Long Island itself to really understand that. Uh, so this diagram right here is essentially representing the different types of harmful algal blooms that have been reported on Long Island alone. So this is just Long Island. This is not, you know, the other 95% of New York, which probably has a bunch of other cyanobacterial problems. But even on Long Island alone, you can see that the sort of cyan circles that you see uh, essentially represents um, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. But we also have many reports of, um, blooms of algae that can also produce saxitoxin or the paralytic shellfish poison, which is highlighted in red. Uh, you generally tend to see that a little bit more on the eastern, uh, uh, eastern coast, uh, eastern side of the North Shore. And then a really big uh, problem that Long Island faces, particularly in the South Shore body of water, um, that's a little bit brown, or it's a, a light shade of brown. It's known as Great South Bay. Uh, that is produced by what's known as brown tide, uh, or the algae that produce uh, that bloom are known as brown tide species. And that's not particularly uh, harmful to us, but a lot of the blooms that are produced by marine species 
are generally going to be are have a lot um, are generally going to be associated with um, being very ichthyotoxic or fish killing. Um, but it's sort of a combination of cyanohabs. And then you have other organisms that could be harmful to shellfish or fish. And then you also have other types of harmful algae that are actually directly harmful to us. So a lot to study. And actually in 2018, the NYSDEC or the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation uh, basically put Suffolk County, which accounts for about 80% of Long Island, as basically the, um, the county with the largest number of lakes with cyanobacterial blooms. And then all of the, but even though it had the largest number of lakes with cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms, um, you still see at least two or three dozen other counties in New York that also report at least uh, one to five lakes that have experienced cyanobacterial blooms in, two, in 2018 alone. So really emphasizing that this is a recurring problem that uh, really, really requires a lot of monitoring and effort to make sure that the public stays safe. And indeed, uh, this link right here in my presentation, I'm not going to click on it because I don't know what will happen. Uh, but just take my word for it that it's actually um, a website. It's actually it, it's a link to a website uh, owned by the DEC where scientists that work for the DEC can collect water samples, bring them back to the lab, do all the necessary analyses, measure toxins, look at what's in there, how much cyanobacteria are in there, and send those reports out to the state so that they can keep the public safe. So it's a really efficient strategy. It's not just it's not just like mailing stuff to different people, but everyone can, you know, the internet has also been introduced to monitoring of these harmful algal blooms. And I would say in Suffolk County, perhaps the, the lake that is the most disgusting, uh, depending on the number of cyanohabs that tend to form there, is Lake Agawam, which ironically is in Southampton, which is, you know, the Hamptons where, you know, all the rich people go and have their big, beautiful houses and, you know, need their beautiful manicured lawns constantly monitored, or maintained over the course of several months. So not surprisingly, that generates a lot of fertilizer and a lot of waste, which surprisingly, once you dump all that stuff into a lake or pond that doesn't get a lot of flushing, gets these really nasty, uh, gets this really nasty green texture to it. So in 2018 alone, uh, there was almost uh, just under 100,000 micrograms per liter of cyanobacteria. So that completely blows the curve in terms of, you know, for, for, the, for the New York DEC, the, rec the bloom status of a lake is if the cyanobacteria are at 20 micrograms per liter. And so this is at 75,000 micrograms per liter. And this is, this wasn't a unique event. We, I mean, we looked at this and we didn't even bat an eye. So it's like, yep, that's, that's our summer for us. Um, and it's, you know, we've, especially in New York, we've had a, we've had milder and milder uh, winters. So even well into November this year, we were still seeing sizable populations of cyanobacteria in Lake Agawam and others. Uh, but looking at the microsystem levels um, at that time, we can see that, especially at the height of the summer, uh, the green line that you see here on the right-hand diagram represents the concentrations of cyanobacteria, and the blue line represents the concentrations of microcystin. And then you can't really see it, uh, but the drinking guideline for microcystin is one microgram per liter, and right around, you know, just before the end of June, the concentrations of toxins were around 10,000 micrograms per liter. So it's a very, it's a, it's what we call a very eutrophic lake. So it gets a lot of nutrients and cyanobacteria love nutrients. They love warm water. You throw those two things in together, they're gonna be, they're, they're, they're gonna be very, very happy in producing lots and lots of toxins and making everyone's summer in Southampton miserable. Um, so as a result, uh, the DEC, uh, in conjunction with actually Governor Cuomo, um, responded actually last year to help start up a strategy to deal with lakes when the blooms become too, too high 
uh, in order to just kind of, you know, all right, everyone avoid it. We'll just ignore this and, you know, wait until it goes away. Um, so this particular, um, this particular setup is known as a uh, mobile harvester system. So basically what it was doing, um, this was kind of in September, October of 2019 last year. It's an $82 million system where they skimmed the surface of Lake Agawam. So cyanobacteria generally tend to congregate at the very surface of the water as a scum. So it's pretty easy to get a huge chunk of the water or a huge um, portion of the cyanobacteria of the water just by kind of skimming the surface. So they skimmed the surface. And basically what they did is that they were treating that water that they collected and they were blasting it with, or they were treating it with hydrogen peroxide as well as ozone uh, in the machine that you see here on the left-hand diagram. Um, and hydrogen peroxide actually is not toxic. Uh, it degrades very rapidly into just, um, into two very inert, uh, inert molecules. Um, but these two uh, features, ozone and hydrogen peroxide, specifically damage cyanobacteria. So they kind of leave the other, you know, the good, the good algae alone. And they can also rapidly break down the toxins that they produce. So it's obviously a very involved process and obviously required a great deal um, in order to, or a lot of, a lot of manpower, obviously a lot of money. Um, but it is a system that works uh, because once we started, and I think I have these actually a little bit out of line or a little bit out of order. But here's me. Um, uh, last last fall, I was you know braving it. I probably should have been wearing a mask and maybe a hazmat suit. Um, but I took a kayak out into the middle of the lake um, because we wanted to not just measure right from the edge of the water, but we wanted to go out uh, where the water was deeper to get a better idea how uh, on how the the cyanobacteria were doing in response to this filtering system. Um, and we measured cyanobacteria concentrations, we measured toxin levels, we were trying to figure out what was in there, and we found that this system actually works. If you suck up most of that cyanobacteria and you blast the water with hydrogen peroxide and ozone, you get clean water and you can deposit that back into the lake and you have a nicer lake to look at. Um, so that was what, that's kind of like the probably a really good representation of the types of, of things I do uh, in terms of working with the DEC to um, monitor toxin concentrations in New York lakes. But a new thing that we've actually started in the last few years is actually looking at the accumulation of cyanotoxins in shellfish. So as I said before, and as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, Toxins that algae produce have the ability or have the tendency to concentrate inside filter feeders like the oyster that you see here. So as I'm sure, well, I mean, I personally love shellfish. I'm sure many people here do too. Um, not being able to eat these guys or eating them and constantly wondering if you're going to maybe die is obviously not a great, not a great feeling to have when you're eating such delicious food. Um, so being able to actually, um, you know, in most cases with marine algae, you know, hatcheries and aquaculture facilities are shut down when toxin levels inside of these shellfish get high enough, but no one is really reporting on whether cyanotoxins can get inside of these shellfish. So that's something that we've recently started to work on during the summer, during the summers of the last few years. And we have actually detected concentrations of microcystin inside of these shellfish. But again, how, how um, toxic it might be to organisms that eat these shellfish, including us, is still very unclear. So finally, I wanna talk a little bit more about me and the types of work that uh, I do specifically for my PhD. Um, so I am advised by Dr. Christopher J. Gobler, who does, he's pretty much the harmful algal bloom guy out on Long Island. And as I've said before, my main focus is to look at the effects of eutrophication as well as climate change on cyanobacterial diazotropes. And my experiments often begin with um, dead lifting water uh, filled with cyanobacteria and their toxins. That's usually how my summer mornings begin. I take these giant 20 liter carboys, 
I have a have a waiter on, obviously not as well secured because it's not my waiter. Um, but I'm filling these uh, I'm filling these carboys up with shamrock uh, colored water, and I'm bringing them back to a lab and seeing how nutrients and uh, climate change factors affect these algae. And in the end, uh, this is actually pretty run of the mill for most um, for most uh, marine scientists. We start, you know, we, we spend our childhood thinking that we're going to study, you know, seals or whales. And then we spend, as I'm sure Taylor can attest to, you know, taking class at Stony Brook. Um, we spend, you know, most of our, we spend most of our time just basically face uh, filtering water and measuring whatever gets stuck on there. Um, but actually my very first uh, experience uh, or my own, my very first project was actually looking at the Lake Okeechobee cyanohab uh, bloom back in 2016. So as I'm sure, again, people in Florida, they probably know what Lake, where, where Lake Okeechobee is and what it is, but it's a 30 mile, 30-ish mile uh, wide lake in the middle of the Floridian uh, Peninsula. And on the Eastern side of the lake, they generally tend to, uh, it generally tends to exhibit very large blooms of microcystins. So very large concentrations of microcystin in the water. Um, in 2008 uh, and 16, the lake was repeatedly drained by the US Army Corps of Engineers for weeks. And they were also not notifying the public that they were doing this uh, because they had an especially wet year uh, that year. So the water levels were very high. So that was why they were draining it out and specifically emptying it out into the um, St. Lucie River estuary. And you can't, you can't really, or maybe you can, kind, you can kind of see it here, but it's in the upper right hand corner uh, of this diagram here, uh, but that's the that's sort of the three the three arms that are kind of branching out from the center. That's the Saint Lucie River estuary, which subsequently empties out into the Indian River Lagoon. Um, and it wasn't really until kind of around the Fourth of July in 2016 where the governor finally declared a state of emergency. Uh, for recovering monetary losses, at least, uh, but not for uh, health protections or stopping discharges. So they kept kept doing that for a little while, and as a result, pretty much ruined everyone's Fourth of July, especially out in the Indian River Lagoon. So even though this is an estuary that is brackish, with you know a certain, it's got some ocean water in there too. Even um, various waterways, various canals had this sludge, uh, slime, scum that was forming on the surface of the water. And even Bathtub Beach uh, had toxin concentrations around about four, just over 400 micrograms per liter. So not even beaches exposed to the open ocean were safe from being exposed a little bit to microcystis because it was an especially bad bloom. So as a result, uh, my advisor really wanted me to get down there and kind of impromptu pushed me on a plane and sent me down a thousand miles and just was like, get on a boat, see what's there. Um, and this was, um, I went in July, uh, on July 8th to July 10th. And then uh, again, on September 26th to September 29th, I sampled Lake Okeechobee, which is the upper uh, left-hand diagram, and then St. Lucie River, which is the lower left-hand diagram. And basically looked at uh, collected samples, uh, looking at chlorophyll levels, as well as toxin concentrations. And you can see, obviously, that I spent a lot of time out uh, in the sun because my forearms are completely baked. I was, I was peeling for a few days. Um, but, uh, basically what we found, and this is actually a paper I published back in 2018, is that the upper, uh, the, the topmost diagram that you see, that you see is basically looking at microcystin concentrations going from Lake Okeechobee all the way out to the St. Lucie River. And then on the, on the right hand Y axis is basically looking at salinity. So as you go from the lake to the estuary, salinity levels are obviously going to go up because you're getting closer to the ocean. And what we found was that salinity um, seemed to have a, a, a protective factor in not only causing the toxins to disappear or, or get smaller and smaller, but we also noticed that the chlorophyll levels of microcystis were also going down. So we were we had gotten there just after the discharge, 
So the ocean water was, had, was starting to have more and more of an effect uh, on the waterways. So salinity, and it was, start, it was starting to kind of stabilize a little bit more. So the microcystis couldn't persist um, after, such a, after a certain period of time because ocean water was causing all those, cell, all those freshwater cyanobacteria to die. And on the, lower, uh, on the lower graph, you can see that uh, basically looking at the concentration of different types of cyanobacteria, um, all of them were cyanobacteria or the ones that were the most dominant. And the green line uh, represents uh, microcystis. So again, microcystis was pretty much the most dominant um, cyanobacteria that was present. So about, uh, and actually they were on the measure of about, I believe that's hundreds of millions or just under hundreds of millions of cells per milliliter were detected um, in the St. Lucie River estuary. And then they started to crash once you got out into the Indian River Lagoon. And then another thing that we actually noticed, um, we found that growth rates, so we did an experiment where on the left-hand graph that you see right here, we treated water that we collected from um, the St. Lucie River estuary that had microcystis and other cyanobacteria in it. We give them either N or nitrogen, P or phosphorus, or nitrogen and phosphorus. And we found that nitrogen actually was the limiting factor that was um, promoting their growth. So if we gave them nitrogen, their growth rate actually increased. Um, but when we gave them phosphorus or nitrogen and phosphorus, not so much. Um, and then we also found a bunch of different types of species. So uh, the top two panels of uh, cyanobacteria represents um, microcystis, as well as another type of microcystis-like looking cyanobacteria. And also the lower left, uh, the lower right-hand cyanobacteria represents um, Dolichus, or sorry, Anabena. So other types of cyanobacteria were present. And we also, I mean, we detected microcystin uh, in the water, but we also found the genes that microcystin, uh, the genes that produce microcystin. And we also actually found uh, the genes that actually are responsible for producing that paralytic uh, toxin, saxatoxin. Although we didn't actually detect the saxatoxin in the water. And that's, again, kind of re-emphasizing the fact that a lot of these toxins, even though they're present in the water, they're, they degrade, they can degrade very rapidly. So the genes that produce these toxins might be there, but the actual toxins themselves, if they're not particularly stable, might not be there. Um, so I do, I know we're kind of at the 45 minute line. I do have a few more slides, but I, I don't want to, I want to give people a little bit more time or a little bit of time to ask me questions. I know I've probably bombarded you guys with a lot. Um, but yeah, uh, I think I'll, I, I did basically, I, 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 maybe I won't show you the results, but I will, I will briefly talk a little bit about, um, one of the current chapters of my PhD that I'm working on which is looking at um, freshwater acidification. So um, I'm sure some people have probably heard about ocean acidification and how carbon dioxide is getting into the oceans. So the, that carbon dioxide from fossil fuel emissions or you know, people just using their cars excessively um, and burning fossil fuels gets into the air and then it gets into the ocean and due to a series of chemical reactions causes the pH to drop to make it more acidic. And that can be really harmful to a lot of life in the ocean, but uh, not a lot of interest has been given to freshwater acidification and whether that might be possible. And that's mainly because uh, it's believed that uh, freshwater lakes and ponds are already super saturated with CO2 or carbon dioxide because the ocean pH is around eight and the fresh and a lake and ponds pH is generally going to be around seven. And that's mainly because there's more CO2 in the water. But when we see these bigger blooms of cyanobacteria, they're sucking up all of that carbon dioxide and potentially turning those freshwater lakes and ponds into sinks for atmospheric carbon dioxide to be, you know, to diffuse into. Again, anything that diffuses is going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That is the same for solutes in water, and it's the same thing as, gas, as gases going from the air to the water. So my main focus, or the, my main focus uh, for the summer, 
was effectively looking at how uh, low pH can affect the growth, toxin production, and nitrogen fixation of different types of cyanobacteria. So this is one thing that different ty uh, certain types of cyanobacteria can do uh, using that cute little brown, big brown cell in the middle of that plushie. Um, it's a heterocyst, which is a specialized cell type that can take nitrogen gas into the atmosphere and turn it into nitrogen that can be used to make amino acids and proteins because amino, and amino acids and proteins are very nitrogen rich. Um, and if you don't know what dinitrogen is, that's okay. Um, but it's probably worth pointing out that even though we breathe oxygen, that only makes up about 21% of our atmosphere. Dinitrogen makes up about 78% of our atmosphere. So there's a whole lot of it. And even though you probably wouldn't think these guys are very important, they are essentially the reason why our bodies are made out of nitrogen and how we are able to get nitrogen in our bodies because these guys made it available for us through the use of their heterocysts. So last summer, I was essentially looking at how out there in the field, I know I'm not wearing my mask appropriately, uh, but I swear I was by myself the whole time. I just needed to breathe because it was very hot this summer. Uh, but I was looking at how nitrogen, uh, elevated temperature and bubbling with uh, air that was enriched with carbon dioxide could affect these algae. And I would like to go into the results, but I know I'm kind of running out of time and I want to make sure you guys uh, get a chance to talk. Um, so, and also, I mean, I do have some data worked up, but like, it's kind of, still kind of in the process of working it up. But with that, um, I really wanted to thank you guys for uh, paying attention during my talk. I hope you learned a little bit. Um, I would also obviously like to thank Taylor for inviting me. And if you want to follow the Gober Lab, we actually are on Instagram. And I am currently in the process of writing uh, my dissert, uh, writing my PhD, so I'm not really doing a lot of work right now myself. But I know a lot of people are doing some interesting stuff, uh, even in the winter. So it's a fun, it's a fun little viewing experience if you'd like to get on Instagram. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again for uh, listening to me talk, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Very cool. Thank you so much. That was really very interesting. I. We talk about algae blooms down here a lot because we do get a lot of algae blooms, but I feel like you just, oh, there's another one and then you move on. You don't actually get to get into the nitty gritty stuff. So that's very cool. Yeah. Um, we have quite a few questions um, in the chat. I don't know if you want me to read them off or if you just want to open the chat, I think you should be able to access it um, if you stop sharing your screen. Sure. There, and it should be at the bottom oh, yeah. by the share screen. Yeah. Um... I guess we could start with that first. <laughs> um, so, okay, uh, TJ asked, uh, you said that the different halves are only in certain parts, uh, aren't only in certain parts of the world. They are found um, in the same latitudes or is it more, or are they found in the same latitudes or is it more like some are found near shore and others are offshore? Um, that's a really good question, TJ. Um, so they are I'm trying to come up with the right way to say this in terms of geographic and geographically speaking, but it's believed that most most harmful algae generally tend we generally tend they generally tend to become a problem for the public um, when they are right near shore. So they're kind of hugging that coastline. Um, but it's believed that they originate actually offshore, especially in the case of Karenia brevis. Uh, it's believed that um, they generally tend to form offshore and then as a result of wave action, they're eventually going to be pushed a little bit more closely to the shoreline. Um, but out in the open ocean, they're able to get a lot more nutrients um, and they're also able to get a lot of extra nitrogen from other types of cyanobacteria. So that's just Karenia brevis specifically. Um, but generally speaking, the they're going to be found, they can originate offshore, um, but they're not going to really become a problem for, you know, they're not, we're not really, it's, it's a lot harder for us to be able to report on them unless they're white, like right around the, right on the shoreline because we're relatively limited in be, be, being able to detect them. Um, so that kind of ties in with, you know, the shortcomings in HAB monitoring. 
um, being able to kind of, you know, take a plane and just kind of scour the ocean for harmful algae is a little bit of a challenge. We kind of need to wait for them to come to us before we're able to actually notice the potential damage that they can cause. And it actually um, can be a big problem in terms of figuring out when there's like a mass mortality event, like especially if a bunch of dolphins like wash ashore dead, um, we might be able to detect toxins um, in their gut or they ate fish that were contaminated with, uh, contaminated with toxins, but it's not clear when they ate it, when they came into contact with that algae um, or if they did it all. So it's really hard to figure out exactly where they show up. They generally tend to congregate along, um, along near shore at some point though. Um, but yeah, um, at the same latitudes, um, that's, a, that's also at the same latitudes. I'm not so sure about that. Um, I think it really depends on a few other factors because you don't see, you, like for instance, you see Karenia brevis like in New Zealand. Um, you see it in a few other parts of the world, obviously Florida, sometimes North Carolina, um, but you don't see it that much in California. And I, I think that's really a question in terms of figuring out what causes different species to form in different parts of the world. Uh, hopefully I answered your question there. It was a little, a little bit long-winded. <laughs> um, Rachel, uh, so can home ponds such as, uh, as, uh, as and such get cyanobacteria blooms? Should homeowners be concerned? If yes, can we do anything to prevent or reverse it? Also a good question. Um, so with a, if it's a sort of artificial ponds, I mean, there's no reason it's, it, it really kind of depends on, there's always going to be something, some type of bacteria that's going to be in your pond and that bacteria is not necessarily bad. I think if you, it would be the equivalent of just letting like nitrate and other types of nutrients build up in an aquarium and not cleaning that water. If you're not recycling that water and filtering it out and maybe making sure that it stays mixed, then yes, you can totally have a cyanobacterial bloom in there. Um, when it happens, um, just start filtering your water. Or you can also put some hydrogen peroxide, you take your fish out first, put your hydrogen peroxide in the ponds, and then everything dies. Um, Taylor, uh, how likely is it when there's an algae bloom that there will be a resultant dead zone? Uh, do they still occur? Just not as long as marine environments when there's plenty when there's plenty of mixing. Uh, also, a very good question. Um, I personally, even in Lake Agawam, uh, I have measured dissolved oxygen levels there myself, and I've never really seen it get hypoxic. I'm not sure why. Um, I think, and, and and that's a lake that's pretty much closed off as its own independent thing. Um, it's possible that I I think maybe once winter comes along you start to get a lot more mixing because uh, a lot of storm and wind activity you might be able to get enough oxygen in there by physically forcing it in so that you know there's enough oxygen where it doesn't get hypoxic um, but that can it 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 it's having an algae bloom and doesn't always doesn't always result inevitably in a dead zone is what I'm trying to say. If you have enough mixing um, either by you know the, either by currents or by wind activity, you can still have enough oxygen to make sure that none of those animals in there die too. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Carly. Is it possible to get an algal bloom in an aquaponic system? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so a lot of, uh, I know a lot of aquaculture facilities and a lot of other, a lot of other facilities that maintain like, you know, aquatic organisms, like they definitely need to, when they take that water like out of a, like a near shore estuary or whatever, they UV the hell out of it. Um, so they are definitely, do, they are sterilizing it as much as possible before they um, supply it to whatever they're trying to grow. So yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, if you've got water and nutrients, doesn't matter if it's artificial or not, you can definitely have a cyanobacterial bloom. Um, Rachel, 
is it, uh, if it is uh, rich in nitrogen, could HABs potentially be harvested and turned into fertilizer? Or can it be used as maybe something helpful? Excellent question. Um, with HABs, I don't know. I think you would have to do something that would specifically, I would be a little concerned about the toxins that they produce, also potentially getting into the fertilizer. Um, not necessarily harmful to us because we wouldn't be eating the plants, but if the fertilizer, I mean, if you have like a stray deer that comes into your backyard and starts eating your plants and then it gets sick and dies, that could potentially be due to the, the toxins that didn't get degraded during the fertilizing process. Um, I do know that there are, um, well, there's actually someone in the Gobra lab that is actually growing um, kelp. Uh, during the winter time, specifically, so that's a really big macro algae. It's not like a single celled algae that you know once it dies, all of everything that it everything that it did in terms of you know producing oxygen, consuming CO two gets undone. Um, kelp is a really big organism that they deploy out in um, bays and estuaries to basically soak up nitrogen and phosphorus, and then they grow, and then you know. Once it comes summertime, they take it out and then they, they can redeploy it during the winter time because the kelp generally likes really, really cold water. Um, but that, that is a very good question. There's no reason why um, at least non-toxic uh, algae can be used as a fertilizer. Uh, Jose, um, are, there, are these algae bloom occurrences becoming more frequent? Absolutely. And what about their intensity? intensity? Also, absolutely. Um, so those really big blooms that you that you saw in Lake Tahu, which is in China, also in Lake Erie, um, those those were those are a lot more intense now, especially uh, in the 2010s, than they ever have been in recent history. Um, and that again is mainly just because they are just getting super saturated with nutrients, and the wa and the water is getting warmer. So one thing that I didn't really make clear is that cyanobacteria, more than any other type of harmful phytoplankton, they absolutely love when it's warm. They love 30 degrees Celsius. They love anywhere between 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. Things like diatoms and even, even Karenia brevis, they like, they can't really, well, actually probably dinoflagellates like warmer water too, obviously. Um, but cyanobacteria, they love warm water. So you give them plenty of nutrients and plenty of water, plenty of warm water, they're going to do great. Um, Rachel, do you recommend weightlifting to everyone who wants to get into marine science? Um, not with those carboys, uh, because they have metal handles that will cut into your skin. So it's very unpleasant. Um, I finally like caved this summer and I got an undergrad to help me. So um, yeah, just, just carry them, just carry them. Don't, don't try to, don't, don't use those metal, don't use those metal uh, handles. They are, they were not, they were not designed to be comfortable. Um, and then Taylor, uh, do most HABs involve a singular species or, or have there been cases of multiple studies causing multiple issues? Uh, do they usually outcompete one another or are they just more prominent in certain areas? So in the last few decades, it's been traditionally, people use the term monospecific bloom. So when you think of Karenia brevis or when you think of red tide, you automatically think of Karenia, well, most scientists or at least think of Karenia brevis. Um, but I think people are starting to appreciate the possibility that it might be more of a mix. I know that there are plenty of lakes out here on Long Island um, that, have, that can have a mix of different species. So you might see microcystis and dolichospermum together and actually, it's possible that dolichospermum, which is a nitrogen fixer, is actually making nitrogen available for microcystis to grow. So I'm not saying that this is a symbiotic relationship in any way. I think it's just like, oh, thanks for the nitrogen. Now we're going to grow now. Um, and there is some evidence of competition. So there's a term that a lot of people use um, in ecology known as allelopathy. And that means that other species can, usually through some form of chemical warfare, can outcompete another organism. Um, and that is something that a lot of people have looked at with harmful algae, um, including, cyanobac including cyanobacteria. But although the story is kind of mixed, it's not really, it's not like 
the microcystis always outbeats the anabeno or the anabeno always outbeat, outbeats the microcystis. I think actually kind of piecing apart what's causing what is, is still a, unknown, a relatively unknown area. And uh, Rachel said, are there any species like, uh, that like Habs? Are there any critters who would benefit from the blooms maybe food wise? So it's kind of assumed that a lot of harmful algal species are unpalatable. Um, they are, for whatever reason, they're not particularly rich in some types of molecules. I used to know what this was, but I don't know what, I don't know what it is. But um, cyanobacteria are especially unpalatable, um, or at least like microcystis, I'm sorry, and anabena are, are especially unpalatable. Otherwise, we would have zooplankton blooms that are able to just completely um, consume those giant green tides or those red tides. Um, it's, it's, it used to potentially, people used to think that it might've been like, like the toxins that these hads produce might be anti-predator molecules, but it, I think it's more generally, a, it's either something entirely different that they're producing or they're just not particularly delicious and they would rather wait for some big fat diatom bloom to come around and they could eat that. Um, but no, they are especially unpalatable. Although, you know, filter feeders, they have somewhat less of a choice. They're kind of just filtering the water and they will, they will consume whatever they can get. Um, and even though things like oysters and mussels and clams, like there is no, there are some studies that indicate that the toxins do have some sort of negative effect if they consume too much of a harmful algal species, but they are a lot more resistant uh, to the negative effects that we would experience, like you know par paralysis or you know any other type of neurotoxic effect or liver damage. Uh, from Carly, are there a lot of calcareous organisms in freshwater ecosystems that will be affected by freshwater acidification? So there are freshwater bivalves. So there are mussels, for instance, and I believe there are also clams too. Um, actually, there is a master student in the Gober lab that is looking at a species of invasive Asian clam uh, in Long Island. So, and that's a freshwater clam. So there are freshwater calcareous organisms that may, and also obviously uh, like, can't believe I forgot this, uh, Lake Erie, uh, about 20 years, uh, sorry, all the Great Lakes about 20 years ago due to um, trans-oceanic ships, um, they didn't clean their ballast water, right? Because, and then they dumped that, they dumped their ballast water from a lake all the way in Europe and they dumped them out into, great, into the Great Lakes and a bunch of what are known as quagga mussels completely took over the Great Lakes and they are doing just fine. Um, and although it's, I mean, they would be just as susceptible to acidification as any other calcareous organism. So they're already dealing with very low CO2 levels, but I, as far as I know, no one's really looking at that yet. Um, because I think this term of freshwater acidification is still fairly unknown or uh, still a big sort of gray area for a lot of scientists. And, uh, thank you, Water Witch. Yeah, I think that is the last of the questions. Um, but if you do think of any later on, uh, feel free to email us at meek, M-E-E-C, at nova.edu, and we will pass them right along to Ben because God knows I cannot answer a lot of these <laughs> questions. It gets very technical, very cool. Um, thank you so much, Ben. We did record this, um, so we will be posting it onto our YouTube channel if you missed the beginning or if you want to share it with anyone, your class, et cetera. Um, I'll send you a link when it's up, Ben. It, we do a, a brief editing, so no one has to listen to us chit chat at the beginning. Um, otherwise, we have one more uh, webinar for this month. Uh, this Thursday at 3 p.m., we are going to be speaking to Gina Clementi um, all about uh, bruvs and uh, the global fin print. Um, so it's a lot about shark biology, um, conservation, and all of her efforts um, with her lab. So that'll be really, really cool. Um, again, we're very excited to be expanding our repertoire outside of turtley things. Uh, otherwise, I think that's about it for us. So thank you so much, Ben. Thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Taylor. Bye guys. Have a good one. Stay safe. Yes, absolutely. <laughs>